Hello everyone. This video will be a companion piece to my open office hour that I conducted yesterday. And in the video, I'm just going to do uh, three things. I'm going to create um, a lexical decision task in PsychoPy 3. I'm going to upload that experiment to pavlovia.com. And uh, if, well, I'll probably, I'll briefly go over how to link that experiment to uh, Mechanical Turk. But this uh, video itself will serve as an introduction to PsychoPy 3 as well as uh, Pavlovia and how they interact with each other. All right, so let's just go straight into it. Um, so this is the main folder I'm going to be using uh, for this experiment, and that's called LDT, for Lexical Decision Task. And you can see in, at the moment, the only thing that I have in the folder is a stimulus file. All right, and if we look inside the stimulus file, we can see three columns. Uh, each with different headings. So one's going to be target, one will be condition, one's correct. Uh, these are the words that I'm going to be using in this lexical decision task uh, demo. And you can see I have two conditions. These are the real words, and these are the non-words. And I've gone ahead and created this additional column that will make a lot of sense later. Um, but essentially, this is uh, indicating that the correct response to online is going to be the letter A, because I'm going to use A and L as the uh, keys uh, that uh, participants will use to respond to these stimuli. All right, um, just another important thing to note is to make sure that none of these uh, headers have spaces in them. Uh, that will throw off uh, PsychoPy. So just make sure that these uh, don't have any spaces. So if you have uh, two words, you can either um, like call them target stim, or you can use under um, underscores, things like that. Just to avoid having something like this, like target stim, because PsychoPy won't be able to read that. All right, so let's go into PsychoPy. Um, so when you first open PsychoPy, it's going to open up in the coder view, and we're not going to use that. That's only for people who want to um, code experiments from scratch, and I doubt anybody watching this video will be uh, aiming to do that. <laughs> um, let's see, so the one thing I will do is I'm gonna open up the builder view because that's the, the window that we're going to be actually using to create our experiments. That's just gonna take a second. Okay, great. So now that the builder window is open, I can close the coder window. All right, and let's have a look at what's available to us here. So the first thing we see is, um, this is going to be the timeline of the entire experiment. So you can see it visually laid out for you here. At the moment, there's just one uh, routine, uh, one tr uh, yeah, one routine, and there is there are no components in this routine, so there's nothing going on here. Um, up here is going to be the breakdown of the routine. So right now, you can see that I'm looking at this uh, routine trial, and over on this side, we have all the components that we can add. So these are just the favorites up here. You can uh, select um, stimuli of various types and responses of various types as well. Now. One thing that you should make sure to do um, before deciding whether or not you should con uh, construct your experiment in PsychoPy is to, to go to this website, this github.com slash psychopy slash psychojs. So psychojs is the library uh, that PsychoPy uses. And if you scroll down, you can see which components are supported by this library. So for stimuli, um, these are the available options. Now for our purposes today, all we need is text stimuli and we need responses from a keyboard. So the, that's fine. Um, it's gonna support everything that we wanna do for this experiment. But for example, if you wanted to do something uh, with an oral response, uh, recording a participant's uh, voice, things like that, uh, you can see that there's no microphone uh, available at the moment. But um, there are sound uh, sound stimuli, so if you wanted to use auditory stimuli, that's, uh, that's all good too. Similarly with images and things like that. And it's not listed here, but I think um, they're currently working on having video stimuli, but as far as I know, that's uh, pretty uncommon when it comes to doing psycholinguistic research. All right, so let's go back. So we, we've, uh, we've made sure that um, PsychoPy is gonna be able to meet our needs. So go back. And we can start constructing um, our lexical decision task. So the two things we're going to be doing is presenting a stimuli on the screen 
and then detecting a response. So let's work on our text stimuli first. So we're going to go up here, and this is the text uh, stimuli. So we'll add this component. And so first, it's going to want us to uh, provide some details about this, uh, about this component. So we'll give it a name. We'll call it um, stim display. And you can notice I'm still not using spaces or anything like that. All right, so now we want to say when in the trial this will appear on the screen. And we want it to appear right at the beginning. And we want it to stay on the screen until the participant responds to it. So we're going to leave this blank. And this will mean that the duration is uh, infinite in a sense. All right, uh, the color of the text is white. That's fine. We have a, a gray background, so that's going to work. Uh, the font is Arial. Uh, that works for me. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that Arial is not, um, I forget the right word to use, but it's, it's, uh, it's not perfectly proportioned. So each of the letters aren't the same size. Uh, so it, if, you use other, uh, if you use other fonts like Courier, uh, it means that all of the letters will be evenly spaced on the, on the page. So that reduces any potential confounding variables in terms of the size of stimuli and things like that. All right, so we're going to use Courier for, for now. And then when we go to the height, so right now this is using height units, which is a relative, uh, a relative unit. Now this isn't ideal, because what if our participants have different sized screens? Um, you know, the difference between um, doing this experiment on a small netbook uh, versus uh, someone who has their own external, like, 28 inch screen um, will be very different because the stimuli will actually be different sizes on those screens. So actually don't you like to use, uh, like to use these units? So before, I'm going to actually switch this to 50, and this is going to be 50 pixels, and I'll go and I'll show you how we can switch the units over from, uh, to pixels in a second. Now the position of this stimuli will be 0, 0, that means it's in the middle of the screen. So if you want stimuli to be further to the left or right, you'd switch this number. Um, this would present the stimuli uh, further to the right-hand side of the screen. This would uh, present it further to the left-hand side. And similarly, um, this would present it higher up and then lower down on the screen. And zero, zero, we want in the middle. That's perfect for us. All right. Now, here we have to do something a little bit fancy. So we want to make sure that in every trial, uh, there's actually different text that's going to appear on the screen. So we have to create a variable to do that. And so the way we tell Psychopy that we're going to be, um, that we're indicating a new variable is we're going to put the, or that we're, sorry, that we're pointing to a variable is we're going to use the uh, dollar sign, and then we're going to put the name of the variable afterwards. So in our case, we're going to use target. Now the reason we're doing that is because that's the name of the header in the Excel file where all of our stimuli are. So what happens is, is when this file gets read by Psychopy, the way that it works is that it creates a variable called target. Now for each trial, when a row gets selected from this file, it will make the value in this cell uh, equal to, uh, it will make the variable equal to the value in this cell. So for example, when this is the row being, uh, being run by the experiment, the value of this variable target will become equal to practice. So that's very convenient because it means that we can have this variable here and on each trial, it's going to select a different stimuli from that list. And the way that we make sure it does that is by changing this from constant to set every repeat. So this will change uh, the value of this text equal to the variable on each trial. There's other advanced options that you, can, uh, that you can look at too. You can change the opacity orientation, so you can have words turning around, uh, fading in and out, uh, things like that. Um, this is something that you should definitely uh, kind of play around with yourself. All right, so that's our text stimuli created. So now we can see that a timeline's appeared up here, and it's going from zero to one second and continuing off, showing that this is going to continue indefinitely. Now I'll just make sure that I change my uh, units because I wanted to make sure that I change uh, this to pixels. To do that, I'm going to go to my experiment settings here. 
and I'm going to go to screen. And here I can change the units. So I'm going to change the units from height to pixels. And that's done. All right, so now I'm going to create my uh, response. I want to detect responses from my participants. So I'll create a keyboard uh, component. All right, so here I'm going to call this LDT response. And I do want to start from the very beginning of the trial and last until uh, the participant uh, responds. Now, I, I only want to collect one button press. And as soon as the participants responded to the stimuli, I want this trial to end. So I'm going to make sure that this box is, is checked. Now I have the option of including available keys. If I don't care what key the uh, participant is pressing, if I want to record everything, then I would have uh, this blank. And this is going to mean that any, um, basically any key is allowed. But for my purposes, I only want to make two keys available. I only want A and L. It's going to make sure to put these in inverted commas and uh, separate them with a, a comma. So this is just telling the keyboard component to really only pay attention when either A or L is pressed. And I do want to store, in this case, it doesn't matter if I'm storing the first or last key, but I want to store the first one. Again, they would be the same because we're only getting one key press. If you uh, make sure you don't do this if you're interested in collecting any kind of response data. If you select nothing, uh, not only will it not um, record the key that's pressed, but it also won't record the time that it was pressed at, which is obviously very important for our purposes. All right, so we'll go to, um, we also want to store whether or not this is correct or not. So if you remember in our um, stimulus file, we have this column called correct, which is basically going to uh, tell us which key is the correct answer for each of these trials. So again, just like the target, when one of these rows is selected, for example, this one, uh, this variable correct will become equal to A. So we can use that variable here. Again, we're going to indicate that we're using a variable by putting the dollar sign. And then we're going to just have the value, uh, variable correct. So every, um, every trial, the correct answer will be updated um, appropriate to the uh, row in the Excel file. All right. Uh, this doesn't matter. Um, if we look in data, that's fine. Great. You can see here we can save offset and onset times. We, of course, we want to do that. All right. So that looks good. So we've added that. So now we can see that our um, trial has both of these things. I'm just going to change the name of this to uh, Lexical Decision. OK, so maybe one other thing that we want is a fixation point to make sure that our participants are looking uh, in the center of the screen where the stimuli is going to appear um, for each trial. So we'll just create a separate routine for that. And we'll just call it fixation. And we'll just add it here. And the only thing we want to do is we just want to have a, a cross up here in the center of the screen. Let's call it fixed point. And we want to start from the beginning of this, uh, of this routine. And uh, a one second seems reasonable to me. And let's just keep this consistent. We'll also have it be courier. And here we should make sure to change the height. We'll have it be the same as our other stimuli. And it can be constant. It doesn't need to change every trial. Perfect. So now we need to make sure that our um, Excel file is communicating with, uh, with these in a meaningful way. So the way we're going to do that is going to add a loop, and we're going to loop it around these two routines. All right. And the name of this can be trials. That's fine. And so here we can select the order uh, that, the, that the rows in the Excel file will be selected. So in this, we could select sequential, in which case it will move down from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 sequentially. Um, but for our uh, purposes, we'll have it be random. Uh, to be honest, I really don't know what this does. <laughs> I've tried it checked and unchecked. It seems to do the same thing. But essentially, uh, sometimes you'll use loops around blocks of trials. 
Um, and you can unclick this, but to me it functionally hasn't made any difference. So if anybody understands what this does, please let me know. <laughs> All right, but anyways, it's not, uh, in any case, it's not very um, important. So we'll go to uh, n reps. So this is going to say how many times this loop is going to loop through all of the conditions in the, in the folder or in the file that we, uh, that we upload. So let's upload our file. It's our stimulus file here. So make, just make sure um, that you're actually in the right folder. So we're in the RLDT folder, we get our stimuli and we can see that there's 10 conditions and three parameters, target, condition, and correct. So those are our three variables. And so we want each, all of these 10 conditions to be presented just once. So this will be equal to one. You can also select uh, specific rows. So if you're, for example, if you want to run uh, different uh, blocks of, uh, of stimuli, if you've counterbalanced your experiments, you have like a stimulus set A and B, um, you can actually just house them all in the same file and then change uh, between the rows that are selected um, similarly, if you want to present uh, blocks of trials that are within one uh, Excel file at the same time, you can also, um, you can also do that um, by following the syntax that's showed here. So you just uh, indicate which of the rows are being used for that trial, and only those rows will be gathered and then uh, presented. All right. So now we should have a loop going around. So this is basically the entire core of our experiment uh, finished. So we'll just take a second to quickly um, add instructions at the beginning. And we'll just do this by adding a text element, leaving it set to constant. Uh, we wanna present it on the screen indefinitely. Make sure, we'll make this text a little bit smaller just to make sure it fits. Oops, and then we'll just call this, and we'll, we'll just write very briefly our uh, instruction test text. So we'll say press A, four words, press L, four non-words, and we'll say press space, oh, we'll put that off the side, press space to begin the experiment. So again, this will be presented in the middle of the screen. I'll just change the uh, font to courier to keep it consistent, and that looks good to me. Great. And we want to add that space bar to make sure that uh, they can move away or progress from the instructions page. And in this case, um, typically I put nothing, but maybe you're curious about how long uh, the participant has spent reading the instructions. That's one, uh, can be one potential way to weed out problematic participants. Um, if they haven't spent any time at all reading your instructions, then maybe they're not uh, taking the experiment seriously and possibly responding randomly to your stimuli. So we'll, we'll just record this, because uh, why not? It's free information. And we'll just call this uh, instruction reading. Uh, one useful uh, thing to, well, it's, it's useful to name, especially your res uh, response variables, because these are the names that are going to be inputted into the data output file at the end. So it just makes it, it easier to identify what responses you're actually looking at. All right, and there's no correct answer here, so we'll leave that blank. Looks good. Okay, and then at the very end of the experiment, I just wanna add a thank you message. Of course, I'm very thankful that people have been doing the experiments, but the most important thing about this page is to make sure that the data gets saved uh, correctly. So what happens uh, with this program is with, when you create a, uh, when, sorry, when the experiment is being run, the data isn't saved until the last routine has finished. So for example, if I was to leave this open like this, when participants get to the end of the experiment, they'd see potentially a thank you message, but the data wouldn't actually save until they properly exit from the experiment by pressing escape. Now, I used to just have a message that said, please press escape to leave the experiment, but a lot of participants had already kind of checked out <laughs> by the time they got to the, 
the, that last screen, and lots of participants actually just closed the window uh, instead of escaping properly. So what that, what ha what the result was that none of their data ended up being saved. Once they closed the window, it was all lost. So now I just include this, uh, this timed uh, message at the end, so it just lasts for two seconds, and I just ask them to please wait while your data is saved. Thank you for participating. Great. So this just cues them to kind of wait a second, and then as soon as this two second clock um, ticks all the way down, then the experiment will end and their data will be saved, and they'll see a little uh, message appear on the screen. Uh, since I've been doing this, I haven't had any issues with uh, losing participants' data like I used to. And let's just change this to courier. Okay. That's going to look just like that. Okay. So we've got our instructions at the beginning. Then we go through 10 repeats with a fixation point, selecting different stimuli. We're going to collect responses um, based on the A and L button presses and then our experiment is done. Great, so our experiment has been completely constructed. So now we want to save everything, uh, create the experiment file, and then we want to upload it um, to Pavlovia. Okay, we'll call this LDT. So we always want to keep the namings consistent. So we want to have the folder that it's in, have the same name as the experiment, and then the experiment will have the same name as the project that's then uploaded to Pavlovia. All right, so I've clicked the Save button. And if I go back to my folder now, I can see that a PsychoPy experiment file has been created. So this, but this is still not online yet. So the way that we um, interact with uh, Pavlovia is with these buttons up here. Now I've said Pavlovia a lot of times without explaining what it is. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is Pavlovia. It's a website, um, it's a platform where people can host their experiments that they've created in PsychoPy. So if I go at the top, you can you know, read the documentation, all the information about uh, Pavlovia here. Then if you go to Explorer, uh, you can actually explore through other people's experiments. So you can see all of the other experiments that have been uploaded, some of mine. I think, yeah, th we have other uh, lexical decision uh, experiments here too. This is lexical decision demo. So um, if you're curious, you can always click on these experiments. And you can see this experiment is running. So if we wanted to actually run this experiment, we could launch it here. And this is actually going to launch uh, this other person's experiment if, it, if it's working. It looks like this person's experiment isn't working. <laughs> So we won't be able to do it today. But the other thing you can do is like, so if you're curious about somebody else's uh, experiment too, like let's say we were curious about why this one's not working, we can actually go into the uh, repository with all of the information. Uh, this, this, has, this is where all of the uh, information is stored uh, about the experiment. So that's going to include all of the uh, data files, their, uh, the experimental code for the experiment, and all of that. So what we're going to do is we want to create one of these for our experiment. So I'm going to make sure that I'm logged in. So there's, there's me. And if I go over here, here's all of my experiments. So now I'm going to create a new uh, project or a new experiment uh, for, for this lexical decision task. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to, well, first I'll just make sure that I'm logged in. I am. If you're not logged in, then you can, uh, just e very easily make a, a profile. It's just a matter of filling in, I think, five lines or something like that. It's really nothing. So once you're logged in, you can then sync the experiment. So I'm going to click this button, and it's going to prompt me to create a new project because it's not detecting that there's any um, experiment called uh, LDT on my uh, page or on my profile on Pavlovia. So again, I'm going to call it the same thing, LDT. Um, the owner will be me, and I'll just say uh, open office hour LDT experiment. All right, and I can create some different tags. Maybe I want to call it, say, LDT 
uh, psycholinguistics uh, demo <laughs> wow whatever I want I can have add as many tags as I want and now this is an important box here uh, if I click public that means that all of my all of the files that I upload into my repository will be um, publicly viewable um, if you don't want that to happen just don't click that box um, but in this case well I don't really mind um, no, uh, nothing in this experiment uh, need be kept private so I'm going to click this in public this is also really great for uh, as a in terms of open science because it means that this experiment will be become uh, very easily replicable so let's say I'm actually conducting a real experiment and I publish my results and then someone wants to replicate my experiment by, you know, maybe they want to use the same stimuli with different participants. Maybe they just want to do this whole thing over again. Maybe they want to slightly tweak the stimuli that I used. Uh, they could simply uh, find my experiment online and copy the entire thing or uh, into onto their Pavlovia profile and then start running uh, the experiment uh, as easily as that. Similarly, if someone is asking you questions, um, like at a, at a conference or um, in during the review of one of your uh, publications, then you can easily point them to the, uh, to the link where your experiment is hosted and they can see for themselves what's really going on. It adds this uh, beautiful layer of transparency to everything that, you, uh, everything that you do experimentally. All right, so this looks done, so I'm gonna create the project. So, as I've done that, um, as I, after I click that button, uh, a lot of things have happened. So this is something that's called a commit. This keeps track of all the changes that I make uh, to this project over time. So right now I'm not actually changing anything. This is my first commit, and I've just created a new, um, I basically created the experiment. I haven't, all right. So I'm just gonna just click okay to that. We'll see uh, what, what um, We'll see what that actually does in a moment. So a lot of things have just happened. So if I go back into my uh, folder here, uh, we can see a lot of new things. So we can see two git files. Uh, this is typically not uh, viewable. So if you, on most computers, if you go up to, I don't know how to do this on Mac, I apologize. <laughs> uh, if you go up to view, uh, right now I've selected uh, to view hidden items. And that's how I can see these git folders. Um, if I um, if this isn't clicked, as is the default on, uh, on Windows, you won't see that Git folder. But I like to know uh, where my Git folders are on my computer, so I'll always have my hidden uh, items viewable. And you can see it's like just slightly less, uh, more slightly uh, less opaque, <laughs> more transparent than the other, uh, other things. Uh, the other thing that we see that's different is this HTML folder. So this is going to be all of the, uh, this is basically compiled all of the code that we need to run this experiment on a web browser. So I open this up. I have a lot of things in here. So this is the index. For anybody uh, familiar with uh, JavaScript and uh, interacting with web browsers at all, you'll notice that this is the HTML code for the screen. So this is actually what, uh, what manages what appears on the screen during your uh, experiment. And here we have the JavaScript code. So this is the code for all of the exper uh, for everything uh, in our experiment. And if you're curious, you can go in and read through all of this and understand uh, how the PsychoJS library works. If you're ever interested in doing that, it's really crucial to use uh, the information available on this website, on that GitHub. Again, you can go into the API and you can see how all of the different components work. So for example, if you wanted to do some tweaking with visual stimuli, the text stimuli, you, would, you could find all of the information about how text stimuli are, are created and all of the different uh, variables that uh, go into that here. All right. But that might be a bit um, ambitious to start out. <laughs> And then this is a, an alternate version of the uh, JavaScript code that's designed to run in older browsers. Now we have one more file. This is our resource file, and currently it's empty, which is a problem because I should have my stimuli file in there. So what happens, this is a, uh, a bug that hasn't been fixed yet. 
So essentially, if you upload your STEM file before creating, what's going on here? Okay, cool. Um, if you upload your stimulus file before creating the experiment, it doesn't uh, get read into the resources folder. So I'm gonna have to do this again. The only thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open my loop and I'm gonna load the same stimuli again. Click OK, save. Always make sure that you save before you refresh. And I'm gonna, uh, well, I'm, I, I keep calling it refresh, but it's really uh, syncing it. So here I'm going to add, I just added stimuli. Added stimuli, click OK. All right, so after doing that, if I go back into this folder, I should see my stimuli there. That's great. And so this is everything I need. This is what uh, appears on the screen. This is all the back end, and this is the resources that we need to run it. So this looks pretty good. Now, what I wanna do is go to Pavlovia and actually see if this experiment is here. There we go. So here we can see um, this LDT is now a project um, on my dashboard. And if I go into here, I can. this is all the information about the project. So if I want to look at the repository where all of my files are, I'm gonna click this view code button. This is going to take me over to uh, GitLab where I have all of my files stored. So if I look at my local folder here and compare, I can see that we have exactly the same uh, information in both of them. And if you remember, I was entering that information about commits. And we can see here that, so for example, this um, the stimulus uh, folder was uploaded during the first commit. But if I look at in this resources folder, this was only created in my second commit after I added stimuli. So this is very useful for keeping track of what gets changed every time you make, um, every, every time you alter your uh, experiment in some way or whether you add something. Uh, the other great thing is that if you're working in a team on a particular project, um, you can actually keep track of what changes were made when and by who. So here you can see there's me, I created the repository and then this was the first commit that happened five minutes ago. And again, I made another uh, change and I added the stimuli two minutes ago. And if you click on this, uh, it will show you more details about what actually was added. So here you can see that it was actually this uh, stimulus, uh, sorry, the um, Excel file that was added to the code. Here. And you can see all this, so for example, this is the JS, uh, the JavaScript for legacy browsers, that was updated. The same line was updated in the, uh, in the LDTJS, and so on. And the, again, the uh, line was again changed in the LDT PsychoPy experiment folder. All right, so that all looks good. So I think we should try and run this experiment to see if it actually works or not. I think before I do that, I'm gonna add one more thing. So at the beginning of the experiment, uh, a window is going to pop up and it gives us a, an opportunity to collect some uh, demographic information from our participants. So if I'm running this on mTurk, I'm always gonna get their mTurk worker ID. Maybe I want their age and maybe what country they live in. It's almost always the US if you're doing stuff on mTurk. The majority of workers are in the US. And maybe I want whether they have any visual impairment. And I, I haven't mentioned this yet. I think I, um, you basically, it's better, it's just a bit easier to always 
once you've created an experiment, you should be running it in the same version uh, that you created it in. So I want to make sure that I'm, and, and just stay consistent with it, um, especially if you're debugging things and if you have anything going wrong with your experiment, you don't want any extra potential variables that are going to screw you up. So some things do change from uh, version to version. And if you're not staying um, kind of up to date with what changes were actually made, then that can, can kind of throw you off and cause problems. So it's good to keep consistent with what version you're using um, unless uh, you're doing it uh, for a reason, like changing the version for a reason because you notice that something, uh, that there's a new feature that's available that you need for your experiment. All right, so again, we're going to save. If you don't save uh, and then you sync, it won't actually detect any of the changes that you made. I believe there's a setting somewhere, um, I forget where it is, where you can ensure that uh, your experiment is auto-saved before you sync. So for this one, I'll say added demographic questions. Click OK. All right, so let's go back here, just reload this. And once I've reloaded this, I can see that um, these files were changed to add these new demographic questions. And you can see that, uh, for example, this uh, file, the stimulus file, which is unaffected by those changes, uh, shows that the last time it was altered was on the first commit. So this is a really uh, useful way to keep track of what gets changed. All right, we'll just close this because we don't, actually we'll leave it open for now because we'll go back and look at our data file. So now if we want to run this uh, experiment online, uh, well, we don't want to pay to run anything yet uh, because we want to make sure that it works. So we're just going to select this piloting option. This gives us the option of running our experiment as many times as we want uh, for free. Um, another option is to, uh, I'll, sh I'll, I'll show you it after. So we'll, we'll just do this first. So we've selected this, uh, we've changed the status of our experiment to piloting, uh, and this will free up this button. And so now we can uh, click pilot and it should run the experiment. All right, so here we have all the demographic questions that we added. So I'm just gonna make up my own mturk worker ID, click my age, my country, my Canada, and I have no visual impairment. And here you can see all of the resources have been loaded. This is important for anybody uh, concerned about timing. Uh, so if you're worried about the speed of internet connections and things screwing things up, uh, it shouldn't matter. Uh, the, connection of, the connection speed should only affect the speed that the resources are downloaded initially. But now, um, this web page is not going to be interacting uh, with the internet at all until the data is saved at the end. So any um, latency, sorry, any internet latency issues shouldn't be affecting uh, the latency measures of the experiment because everything is already preloaded. Okay, so now I've got my instructions page. Okay, press A for non-word. Okay, cool. All right. So uh, this is a non-word, so I'll press L. That's a word. Press A. L. L. A. All right, so here I'll, I'll intentionally make an error. So I'm going to press L to indicate that I think this is a, a non-word. L again. L. A, A. All right, so the experiment is completed. And you can see that message stayed on the screen briefly. Maybe I should have that on for one more second. And then the data was saved. Now, because I'm in piloting mode, the data doesn't actually get saved to my repository. If I look in here, nothing has changed. The data file is saved into my browser. So I can open it here and have a look at what is inside. And I don't need this open anymore. Okay, so now this is our data output file. 
So we'll just go, uh, we'll go column by column. So at the beginning, we have this instruction reading dot keys. So if you remember, we had this instruction reading uh, component here. So this instruction reading dot keys tells us the key that was pressed, which will always be space in this case. And then we have this instruction reading dot RT, which will say how many seconds it was um, since the beginning of that trial when I pressed the space bar. So it was eight, just over eight seconds. All right, so now we have the LDT response. So again, this component uh, dot keys. So this tells me what key was pressed. And this tells me whether it was correct or not. So if you remember, I intentionally made this error uh, in the word online. And so you can see that this zero is indicating that this was in fact an incorrect response. So this letter didn't match the correct letter. So if we look across, so here L was the letter that was pressed, but A was the correct one. And they didn't add up, so that they returned a value of zero. And this will be my response time, again, in seconds. Uh, this information is not very useful. I typically always delete it. Um, the only thing it really tells you is tells you how many trials there were, but you can see that by counting down this way. And it tells you how many times it ran through uh, that loop. And it tells you, for some reason, the uh, original order of the words in the Excel file. So I don't, I don't really know why. So it starts from zero. So we've got online. The second word would be experiment. Third word was lexical. Um, so that's the order that they were in the original uh, folder before they were randomized. So I don't know why that's useful, <laughs> uh, but maybe it will come up for somebody, but it's never come up for me. Uh, I typically always just delete these. I add in my own trial uh, order stuff myself. Like, yeah, all right. Next thing, so here's the target that was presented the condition and, and correct. So you can see all of this information was originally in my, uh, is saved from this. So if you do want to add in any other like uh, stimulus properties, uh, it's an easy way of keeping all of that information together. I mean lexical statistics and things like that, like frequency measures and all that. All right, then we've got all of the information from our uh, demographic questionnaire. So we've got their uh, MTurk worker ID in this case the age, country, and visual impairment. This is the date and time that the uh, experiment uh, took place when it began. So that would be, so now it's 219, so it was about four minutes ago. <laughs> um, this is the name of the experiment, the version, and then these are two very useful things. So it detects automatically my operating system and the frame rate uh, of my screen. So this is, uh, I've never actually seen a frame rate other than 60 um, until now, um, but it's, it's useful to give this a quick check. And although I've uh, not noticed any differences myself, you may wanna, you can just add this into a, into a model uh, of your data later to see if there's any uh, significant differences across operating systems, but I haven't seen anything uh, myself. All right, so that's all of our data output going to close this and I don't need this anymore either. All right. So now let's look at how uh, credits work on, uh, on Pavlovia. So right now um, I'm piloting this, but if someone were to run this experiment from another computer, it wouldn't actually save this data on my computer. In order for me to have access to the data that's produced by this experiment, it needs to be saved into my repository. So in order to do that, I need to switch over to the running status. But it tells me that I don't have enough credits assigned to the experiment to run it. And you can see I have zero credits assigned, zero consumed, zero reserved, and zero available. Now the nice thing is that I can go to one of my, well, I do have uh, credits available. I don't know why it's not showing all of my experiments. Hmm. All right. I believe, oh, maybe that's why. There we are. So I do have a couple of running experiments that have available um, tokens on them. 
So for this experiment, I have 102 tokens available. I'm just going to take one token away, one token away, and I'm going to update the assigned credits. And you can see now I have 101 credits available on this experiment and one available. I can, I can take all of these away if I want um, and have them be available, but I'm, I'm potentially going to run this experiment again later. You can also see here that there's um, a reserved credit on this experiment. This was actually me during the open office hour when I opened this experiment, and I didn't finish it. So these credits only get uh, used once the experiment is finished. So if you have credits that uh, you want to that have been reserved, but you know that they're not actually ever going to be uh, that. So I'll just start from the beginning again. Every time you open an experiment, one of uh, that's running, one of these tokens gets reserved. Now that token only gets consumed if you finish the experiment and a data file is saved. So anybody who clicks on your experiment and like just reads the instructions and decides they don't want to do it anymore and exit, they won't consume a credit, but they'll reserve it. And those uh, credits stay reserved. I used to think it was 24 hours, but now I'm, now I'm second guessing myself. That I think maybe it might be 48. But it's good, it's good to make sure to go in and check to make sure that uh, you have enough available credits because when you're running uh, experiments, especially on places like uh, MTurk, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to be curious about your experiment that will just click on it, um, maybe just have a look at a few trials, maybe do the practice section and then exit and decide that they don't actually want to do it. In that case, uh, a lot of credits will be reserved and you want to make sure that you always have excess credits. So if you're trying to run an experiment uh, and get 30 participants, you should have at least 60 uh, assigned credits to that experiment and make sure that between blocks when you're running that experiment to free up all of the reserved credits. All right, so I want to actually run this experiment. I'm going to um, assign my one available credit to it and update. All right, so now I have one assigned credit, so I can actually run the experiment. So I'm going to open this up. And if I refresh this page, now that I've opened this, I've, I've began the experiment, I can see that there's one reserved um, token. And you can see that this was the uh, credit reserved at this time. So I guess this is the time in England. <laughs> yeah, roughly. I think it is, yeah. So this is the time. I wonder if I can change my time settings. Anyway. This might be just uh, Greenwich Mean Time. So I'm not, I don't want to, if I were to release uh, this credit right now, then I wouldn't be able to, if I finished this experiment, my data wouldn't be saved. So I'm going to leave this for now. I'm going to go back over here. Um, let's just add some fake information there. Same stuff as before. Okay, and I'll just quickly run through this. probably fix that. All right, so now my experiment is finished. My data has been saved, but I don't see it saved on my computer anymore. So again, if I go over to, not this one, to my repository and I refresh this, I'll see that there's a new file that's been created. So there's this data file. If I also go back to this experiment, I'll see that there should be one consumed credit. Great and now there's no more assigned and close this. All right, so if I click on this data folder, I have a data file in it and this data file should just, well, so it's a CSV. We can see all the same information as we did before. Um, so how do I get that onto my computer? So I have two options. One thing I can do is download results. So download results, will give me a zip file of all of the um, results collected to date. So when I open it up, I can see that I have this um, Excel file. And these are all the response data collected from the experiment. So that's one option. 
The other option is to use the sync uh, button. So if I look in my local folder right now, I don't have that data file here. That's because I haven't synced my um, repository. Where's my repository? Here. I haven't synced my repository with my local folder yet. So that's what this uh, what the syncing button is do uh, does, and that's what Git does. Is it basically has a repository online and then a local folder, and it just wants to make sure that all of the contents of those folders uh, mirror each other. So if something gets changed in one, it will then change it in the other one. So in this case, a data file has been added to the online repository, and I want to add that same data file to my, repos uh, to my local folder. So I'm going to click this button, and if I look at, on this window, it should it should indicate that a new file has been downloaded. Great. So when I look here, so I can see that this folder, one folder has been added. So one file has been changed, and I have 11 insertions. I think that means, as far as I know, that means that there's 11 lines in, the, uh, in that file. I may be wrong about that. But let's have a look at this folder. And now we can see that this data file has appeared. And it has my response data in it. So the benefit of doing it this way, um, well, I don't know if there's a benefit to doing it either way, but this way uh, you'll, you'll always just download the same, uh, whatever's missing. So whatever new uh, data files have been created, you'll only download those, which potentially avoids some risk of counting one participant data file twice. I don't know. Maybe that's a stretch. All right. So I think we're pretty close to being done now. So we've created our experiment in PsychoPy. We've uploaded it onto the platform, uh, Pavlovia. Uh, we've piloted it. We've looked at our data. We've run it. We've downloaded our data. Now the last thing to do is to put it on mTurk. So this has mostly been covered in Victor Cooperman's open, open Office Hour. But basically the way that you're going to do this is you want to make sure that you have credits assigned to the experiment. Otherwise, it won't work. You want to make sure that it's set to um, the, sat the status is set to running. And you'll use this link uh, to actually link to the experiment. So if I tried to do this now, it's going to tell me that I don't have enough credits. But essentially, this is the link that, will, that, can, that you can post pretty much anywhere uh, to guide people or to like, direct people to your experiment. So if you wanted to recruit via email, you could just email this link out. If you wanted to recruit via social media, you could just post this link on social media. And so if you want to do it on mTurk, so I'll just go to mTurk. You'll have to set up a, a requester account. I think I'll like, yeah, definitely uh, have a look at, at uh, Victor Cooperman's Open Office Hour for guidance in, in, in this, uh, for using this platform. Uh, but so for example, I would create a new project be, uh, the only available uh, option we have is a link, a survey link. So we want to have a link here. So we'll use the survey link option, create the project. Uh, we give all of the um, important information here. I'm just going to, I'm not actually doing any of this in earnest. Um, we'll just save that. And then when you get to the uh, instructions page, so here you'd provide some information about your project. So like demo LDT, da 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 da. Probably something about the ethics. Probably something about what's involved. Um, and keep it brief because a lot of MTurk workers are um, trying to make money by basically completing as many hits as they can. So a lot of them, if you, if you, for example, if you were to include like a full two-page. Um, um, like consent form on this page, I, I doubt that most of them would read it. And then here, you're actually going to put that link. So again, what's important to include here is just everything that you need to know before choosing to uh, participate in the experiment. So most likely like how long it's gonna take, uh, what's expected of them, 
uh, and then some maybe information about the ethics approval from the university that you're at, contact information in case things go wrong, uh, information about withdrawing and whether they'll be paid or not, uh, things like that. Okay, so here I'll add my, my link. And I don't want to call this survey because that's kind of misleading, so I'll just call it experiment. Up here I would also just put uh, experiment information. And then all the information that they need here. Uh, and then here I would change this to provide, I don't want them to provide a survey code. I just want them to provide their mTurk worker ID. <laughs> not, not there, provide your. Um, so th the reason that we don't need to have it to set up any kind of code and have them enter the code once they're finished is because we only collect data once they've finished the um, experiment. So as long as we know their mTurk worker ID, we can go into our folder and check our data files. And every time we get a new data file, uh, we should be able to see exactly who that worker is. And so if we don't have a data file uh, that has their worker ID in it, then we can potentially uh, reject uh, their, their, their submission of their hit. This happens quite often that you'll have um, like kind of spam accounts that will just uh, indicate that they've done the work but then not actually do it. I get this quite, uh, yeah, fairly often. So, but this is the, the best way to check. And then if there's anything else going on, like if there was any kind of glitch, I always make sure that I approve uh, their hit. But that's the way that you check. You just ask for their worker ID and then match it to the data file. It's pretty straightforward. Great, so it's, it's just as easy as that. And then once you're finished with this, you just save and preview and then load it up. Um, but again, I think Victor Cooperman uh, goes into much more detail about uh, how to successfully uh, use mTurk for this, for these purposes. All right, so I'll just close this. And I can close this and this. And this. I'll make sure I save this and we're done. All right, so we successfully created that experiment uh, in Psychopy 3. We uploaded it. We learned about how Pavlovia works. We learned some basics on Psychopy 3, and we quickly went over how to link those experiments over to mTurk. All right. Well, thanks uh, very much for watching the video. I hope this was helpful. And again, uh, feel free to contact me uh, with any questions that you have. Um, that's my email. I'm always uh, more than happy to help. So good luck. And thanks again.